speed, and efficiency rule every aspect of modern life. With so much information online, anyone can plan a vacation and fly to any destination with an itinerary that matches their interests, schedule, and budget. With the commoditization of air travel, the destination matters far more than the journey. People in first class share the same sentiment as the people in economy. Everyone wants to get off the plane as fast as possible to maximize their time at the destination and to minimize the time spent getting there. The travel industry has adjusted to this change as resorts, tour guides, agencies, hotels, and airlines now all compete on how fast they can get you to where you want to go. Yet there remains one business who continues to insist that the journey is just as important as the destination. That is the cruise ship. Maritime travel is a difficult sell in the 21st century. A flight from New York to Barcelona takes 8 hours, whereas the same route by ship would be 8 to 10 days. The advantages of air travel in efficiency and speed are so significant that cruises know they can't just rely on nice ocean views to get customers. As a result, cruises are more than just floating hotels that serve food and move slowly on the sea. To reduce conflict with airlines, cruises strategically specialize in routes to remote, tropical destinations that fit the fantasy of sea travel, like the Caribbean, the Bahamas, and Ibiza. They also offer just about every recreational activity on planet Earth to not just help pass the time, but to make the journey so excessively stimulating that passengers have no excuse to be bored. Cruise ships these days boast restaurants, bars, bowling alleys, water parks, Broadway musicals, basketball courts, mini golf, comedy shows, swimming pools, rock climbing, ice skating, casinos, movie theaters, go-karts, nightclubs, laser tags, and even arcades. Throw in unlimited booze where adults can get hammered every morning and bottomless french fries and endless pizza that kids can gorge on every night in a transient low-stakes environment, it makes sense why cruises would lean on spectacle and excess for mainstream appeal. Beyond the onboard consumption and extravaganza, cruises are traditionally most popular with older travelers. Over 50% of cruise passengers every year are between the ages of 50 to 70 plus. Elderly retirees not only have the time and money, but also value the low stress and convenience that cruises uniquely provide. On a cruise, you get to visit many destinations and countries in a single trip. You don't need to deal with repacking luggage, checking into different hotels, and commuting to and from different airports. You get a private room to call home for the entire trip, and the boat serves as a one-stop shop for everything that you would need. Dining, exercising, lounging, shopping, and entertaining. When you get to your destination, you get some time to explore the land on your own, but everything offshore and off the boat can and will be arranged if you don't want to plan anything. Thanks to James Cameron, people all around the world are familiar with cruises and have a solid baseline for what the experience would be like, short of crashing into an iceberg. Yet despite the high awareness and nearly three decades after the release of the Titanic, cruises remain a niche market with low penetration. In 2019, the airline industry carried 4.5 billion passengers on 42 million flights around the world. In comparison, there were 29 million cruise passengers, which was a record high for the industry. Over 50% of passengers who ride cruises every year are Americans. Even if we add up all the passengers that come from Asia, Europe, South America, and the Middle East, the rest of the world combined doesn't match the volume of cruise passengers from North America. By these numbers, cruises are very much an American phenomenon, but even then it's reported that only a third of Americans have ever gone on a cruise. Industry insiders promote these statistics every year, stating that cruises are a uniquely fast-developing, underpenetrated leisure market with significant growth potential. The collective belief is that continued investment in onboard innovation, in the form of food, rooms, and entertainment that no one would think possible to be on a ship like roller coasters, ice skating rinks, go-karts, water parks, and 4D movie theaters will help move the needle, bring in more passengers, and strengthen the value prop of cruises for travelers of all ages, not just the elderly. The cruise industry is an oligopoly run by three players, Royal Caribbean, Carnival, and Norwegian Cruise Line. In this episode, we'll cover the business of cruises and dive into these three companies who each have their own strategy and go after travelers at very different price points. This episode is sponsored by Aura, the leader in intelligent digital safety. Anyone these days can find your personal information online with just one search. It's creepy and uncomfortable to know that your name, email, phone number, and even address is floating out there for anyone to find. Data brokers are making a fortune selling your information to robocallers, spammers, and others who want to learn more about you. Aura can identify data brokers exposing your information and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. 
Data brokers are legally required to remove your information if you ask them to, but they make it intentionally complicated. Aura identified over 30 data brokers that were actively selling our personal information and were a clear source of the many spam calls that light up our phones every day. Let Aura handle that for you and protect you online. You can try Aura free for two weeks using Aura.com MBA. Aura does so much to protect you and your family from online threats that you can't see. It's easy to set up, so you don't have to download different apps or subscribe to multiple tools to get things like parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and more. With Aura, you get everything at one affordable price. Let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online so you can focus on other tasks with peace of mind. Don't let companies exploit and profit off of your personal private information. Go to Aura.com MBA to protect you and your family online. Out of the three major players, Carnival is the most commercially successful. Before the pandemic, Carnival grossed $20.8 billion in 2019, which was over twice the amount of revenue of Royal Caribbean and over three times as much money as Norwegian Cruise Lines. Throughout the pandemic, Carnival has maintained its lead with $12 billion in sales versus Royal Caribbean's $8 billion and Norwegian's $4 billion. Carnival is the largest cruise company in the world, but its success is not just a case of having more ships at sea than its competition. Historically, cruises were positioned like the Titanic as luxury voyages for sophisticated travelers. Carnival was the first company to throw that script out of the window, to undercut its competition, to optimize her volume, and to design for simple, affordable fun over high-end excess. Rather than appealing to the elderly traveler, Carnival targets younger demographics. The company has wielded hip marketing for decades in order to reshape the perception of cruises from formal, serious, posh, multi-week commitments into simple, casual, rowdy, affordable fun for just a few days. With taglines like fun for all, Carnival's message is to not take cruises so seriously. The company will happily bundle food and entertainment into your ticket, so you walk away with the best deal, and Carnival's reputation holds as the party boat with the lowest prices in the industry. Carnival's volume and value approach has clearly been successful as the company carries the most passengers with over 12 million passengers every year, compared to Royal Caribbean's 6 million and Norwegian's 2 million. Cruises make money in two ways. The first and primary revenue stream is through ticket sales. Cruise tickets aren't charged by entry, rather they're priced and presented like hotels where passengers pay for a nightly rate for a specific room on the ship that lasts for the entirety of their trip. The rate depends on room type, if it's a suite, if it has a balcony, how big the room is, if it's on the upper deck, and what section of the boat it's on, with the middle being the most desirable, along with the usual variables like the number of guests, the length of the trip, and the destination. The ticket is what locks down your room, grants access to amenities, and is the biggest cost in any cruise trip. The second main income stream for cruise companies is the sale of onboard goods and services. Cruise ships operate like airports, stadiums, concerts, nightclubs, and movie theaters, as venues where customers have no choice but to pay high markups for basic goods. The same way that flight goers, ravers, and movie goers are stuck paying $4 to $6 for soda or $8 to $10 for popcorn, cruise ships do the same with a significantly broader range of products over a longer period of time and on customers with deeper pockets and a greater appetite to spend. While tickets include access to amenities and entertainment, cruise ships separately sell beverages, essentials, internet, spas, merchandise, photo shoots, laundry services, casino credits, arcade tokens, spirits, candy, beauty products, watches, shore excursions, jewelry, and art. While theaters, concerts, airports, stadiums, and nightclubs can only monetize for the few hours in which their guests are at their venues, cruise passengers are stuck on the boat for days or weeks at a time. This enables cruises to continuously monetize its passengers around the clock for anything and everything. Once you're on board, the goal is to get you to keep spending. If you don't like the price for a drink, for Wi-Fi, for sunscreen, or for a pair of sunglasses, well, too bad. What's on the ship is your only option until the boat arrives at its destination. It's an interesting extreme compared to airports, which generally maintain some facade of competition with multiple vendors. If you don't like what's being sold at one place, you can always try a different store or terminal. In comparison, cruise companies own and operate nearly every single store on their ships. Not just the ones selling the drinks and souvenirs, but also the same casinos, gift shops, candy stores, laundromats, spas, jewelry stores, restaurants, and even those shore excursions. This way, the cruise directly captures every dollar on every onboard sale in full for themselves with no competition. 
the few shops on cruise ships that are operated by third-party external vendors must pay up a percentage of their gross sales, so the cruise company still nets in every transaction. The house always wins, and that is very much true in the world of cruises with high markups, broad cross-sell opportunities, and onboard monopolies. Carnival's value strategy means that they include most of the food and amenities into their tickets. Carnival passengers can feast on unlimited tacos, burritos, chicken sandwiches, noodles, stir-fry, barbecue, soft-serve, pasta, pizza, fries, and burgers, even ones from the mayor of Flavortown, all day, every day, on the boat for no added cost. There are some a la carte options, but for the vast majority of budget-conscious travelers, the free inclusion of copious and endless amounts of comfort food in an already cheap ticket makes Carnival an irresistible deal. While food is included, beverages aren't. So if you want soda, beer, juices, cocktail, or wine by the glass, you'll have to pay separately or buy packages. Unlimited soda and juice starts at $10 a day, or unlimited alcohol at $60 a day. You don't get to choose which days that you want unlimited drinks. Despite being presented as daily rates, these packages are all or nothing expenses that are charged in one lump sum based on the total number of days in your trip. Now that we've covered the two ways in which cruises make money, tickets and the sales of goods and services on board, we can understand how Carnival's strategy drives its commercial performance. Carnival's revenue has exceeded over $10 billion every year from 2010 to 2019. Passenger tickets are the largest income stream and make up a majority of Carnival's revenue, accounting for nearly 75% of the company's revenue every year since 2010. Because of the company's orientation towards value and their generous bundling, there's naturally less passenger demand for onboard goods and services. Sales of onboard goods and services are still a respectable income stream, having grossed nearly $5 billion every year from 2010 to 2019 and representing on average 33% of the company's annual revenue. Between 2010 and 2019, the average Carnival passenger spent a total of $1,529 per trip, so that's the ticket and onboard purchases combined. The total spend of Carnival passengers has remained consistent year over year in the past 13 years, even during the pandemic. We can see just how much Carnival values volume over margin. The average cost of a Carnival trip in 2022 was $1,580, which is only a dollar or so less than the cost of a trip back in 2010. For context, a dollar in 2010 was worth a dollar and 34 cents in 2022. So despite a 34% decrease in dollar value, Carnival is charging the same prices today as it was 12 years ago. The interesting story here is that the average passenger spend on Carnival was going down even before the pandemic. In the period between 2010 and 2017, where passenger spend dropped from $1,581 to $1,443, Carnival carried more than 3 million new customers. The number of passengers on Carnival cruises grew from 9.1 million in 2010 to 12.4 million by 2017. The average ticket price steadily decreased from $1,211 in 2010 to $1,096 by 2019. Onboard spend remained consistent for nearly eight years, hovering at $350 per passenger. Every $1 that a passenger spent on their Carnival ticket translated to an additional 30 cents of spend on board. If lowering ticket prices while bundling in more food means a better chance of bringing in new passengers and getting existing ones to come back, Carnival will happily do so. Cruise ships are built from scratch and are customized for every company. If you want ice skating rinks over there, basketball courts over here, then putting rooms here, restaurants over there, and then an infinity pool over there, these are all things that have to be built during the construction of the ship and can't be tacked on after. A new cruise ship costs roughly a billion dollars, over twice the cost of a new Boeing 747. And while a Boeing 747 can be built in two months, a cruise ship can take anywhere from three to five years from order to completion. Cruises are simultaneously so niche and so expensive that Carnival's current day fleet of 26 ships makes it the industry leader at scale. Carnival also offers the most home ports in the United States, which reinforces appeal with budget-conscious Americans. Carnival passengers can drive to a point of departure nearby rather than shelling out extra for a separate plane ticket just to get on the boat. Despite significantly lower passenger volumes and costly assets, cruise companies surprisingly enjoy great bottom lines. Carnival's annual operating margin, which one might predict to be in the single digits as a value play in a niche market, hovers in the mid-teens at 15%. A 15% annual operating margin is higher than that of American Airlines, 
nearly double that of United Airlines, and on par with the most valuable airline in the world in Delta. If Carnival is simple, affordable fun, then Norwegian Cruise Lines is the opposite in elegance and sophistication at a premium. NCL believes that it's marketing, not cost, that should drive demand. The company's philosophy is that if customers want a good deal, then they should book their cruises early, but prices should always go up, not down. NCL ships are designed with a modern and reserved aesthetic that contrasts from the rowdy backyard pool party vibe of Carnival. Norwegian cruises are more general purpose with a broader range of dining and entertainment options to appease all generations. For the young, NCL provides go-karts, teen lounges, dance parties, laser tags, and water slides. For the older crowd, they offer musicals, spas, casinos, live music, acrobatic shows, and long outdoor promenades that stretch up to a quarter of a mile to enjoy the ocean view from. Despite leaning upscale, NCL makes every effort to message that they're not pretentious or uptight. The average cruise ship carries between 2,000 to 4,000 passengers, and crew alone is another 500 to 1,000 bodies. If all 3,000 passengers were to eat dinner or to attend the same show at the exact same time, the traffics and crowds would be catastrophic. Cruise companies avoid this very problem by controlling passenger flow through time slots and seat assignments. Norwegian throws this convention out the window with its quote-unquote freestyle cruising, where their passengers can dine whenever and wherever they want with no dress code. While Carnival centers on basic comfort foods, Norwegian puts greater emphasis on dining innovation to drive margin and onboard spend over volume and value. NCL ships feature a diverse range of specialty foods and restaurants that passengers would not be able to easily find on other cruises. Foods like grilled ribeye, truffle fries, sea bass, veal shank, risotto, Brazilian barbecue, sushi, lobster, tapas, teppanyaki, and gelato. These specialty restaurants are not bundled into tickets and are not the standard grab-and-go or endless buffets. Instead, each dish is made and charged to order in a fancy sit-down experience, and Norwegian offers no packages for unlimited dining. The dining package that passengers can purchase for their trip on Norwegian cruises is a set of limited credits that values each meal at $30 to $50 per person, not including tip. When it comes to accommodations, NCL's rooms are not as spacious as Carnival's, but Norwegian makes up for its smaller room sizes with greater diversity. A single NCL ship has over 35 different types of rooms. By offering so many room types, the company can sell tickets at a wide range of price points without relying on discounts and flash sales, from a bare-bones 135-square-foot interior cabin that has no windows for the budget solo traveler to the multi-room grand suite for the family that wants to splurge. To emphasize comfort and elegance, Norwegian also sells exclusivity and privacy at a price. The Haven is an exclusive area on NCL ships which have rooms and amenities that are sectioned off from the rest of the passengers. There are only a few rooms available at the Haven and they're a lot more expensive, but travelers who choose to live at the Haven get to enjoy private pools, courtyards, lounges, bars and restaurants, along with hot tubs and a personal butler. You get to stay away from the crowds, the loud noises, and the long lines with this smaller cruise within a cruise experience as regular passengers can't enter the Haven. While NCL's strategy is to lead with quality, the company knows it cannot cater exclusively to an upscale audience without offering some value, especially as cruises are still a niche activity. Norwegian runs a promotion called Free at Sea. Free at Sea enables the company to maintain its higher ticket prices, to deliberately complicate the shopping experience so travelers don't immediately just settle on the cheapest option, and it lets customers still feel like they're getting a deal when they go with Norwegian. Anytime you book an NCL cruise, you get a lineup of free perks in free Wi-Fi, free shore excursions, free specialty dining, and free unlimited open bar. If we take a closer look at the fine print, the bundling is not as generous as the headline would suggest. Free specialty dining doesn't mean you get to eat veal and lobster for free every night. Rather, it just means you get two free meals for the duration of your trip. Once you've spent those credits, the only way to enjoy more would be to buy more meals or to pay the bill. The free Wi-Fi only lasts for 150 minutes, and the free shore excursion is just a one-time $50 coupon. The only perk that actually seems to live up to its billing is the free unlimited open bar, but even then it has its limits. If you order any drink over $15 during your trip, the difference is charged to your account. NCL has 17 ships in its fleet, making it the smallest player by capacity. With higher ticket prices and an upscale target market, Norwegian carries the fewest travelers out of the big three and has seen the slowest growth in terms of volume. 
In the nine years in which Carnival grew over 3 million passengers, NCL grew by just 1.3 million. While Carnival pushes prices down to drive volume, Norwegian has been pushing prices and spend up in order to compensate for lower volume, and these two differing strategies clearly work in their own ways. The average total spend of a Norwegian passenger in a single trip grew by nearly 70%, from $1,433 in 2010 to almost $2,400 by 2019. While the price of a Carnival ticket went down by $100, the price of a Norwegian ticket increased by over $600 per passenger. Norwegian follows the same high markups of onboard goods and services that Carnival does, but to even greater levels. A standard Wi-Fi package that supports audio and video streaming costs $20 a day on Carnival. On NCL, the exact same plan and service costs $40 a day. Unlimited alcohol on Carnival starts at $60 per day, while the same package on NCL is charged at over $100 a day. Even Norwegian's go-karts are charged at $15 per ride per passenger. Since most things on Norwegian ships are not actually free, they're not bundled into the ticket, they have higher markups, and they're charged per use, it's no surprise that NCL boasts the highest onboard spend per passenger in the entire industry. The average Norwegian passenger spent $427 on onboard purchases in 2010 and was spending over $700 per trip by 2019. Every $1 that a passenger spent on their Norwegian ticket translated to on average 40 cents of an additional revenue on board. Sales of onboard goods and services have contributed on average 30% of Norwegian's annual revenue and has grown from a $600 million business to a $2 billion revenue stream. This continuous increase in prices and spend have fueled NCL's top-line growth. The company tripled its overall revenue from $2 billion in 2010 to over $6 billion by 2019. The stronger margins also translate to better profits for Norwegian, with an average annual operating margin of 17% that has reached as high as 20% on certain years. In every niche, there's always room for someone to corner the high-end market. In the case of Norwegian, there are clearly a chunk of customers out there who value the specialty restaurants, the onboard sophistication, and the exclusivity enough to pay this premium. Royal Caribbean is the last mass market cruise line and is the most well-known out of the big three. From a positioning standpoint, Royal Caribbean occupies the middle ground between upscale modern elegance and rowdy cheap pool parties. The company's priority has been on onboard innovation above all else and constantly pushing the envelope on entertainment. Royal Caribbean boasts amenities like the largest and deepest swimming pool at sea with 30-foot diving platforms, the biggest water park with headfirst slides, an 82-foot tall dome, and even a 40-foot long surf simulator. The fun continues indoors, where Royal Caribbean ships are decked out with bumper cars, escape rooms, skydiving simulators, carousels, bungee trampolines, and even a slide that drops you down 10 decks on top of all the conventional amenities. The live shows offered are not just the standard Broadway musicals and comedians, but also feature divers, acrobats, aerialists, and synchronized swimmers. Royal Caribbean's value prop is that while they don't have the fancy dining of Norwegian, or the affordability of Carnival, they'll give you adventure, adrenaline, thrill, and excitement that no one else can. This has helped Royal Caribbean establish a more vibrant atmosphere compared to other cruise lines, as these amenities naturally attract thrill-seekers and more sociable travelers. Beyond the ships, Royal Caribbean's greatest success has been the development and construction of its own private destination, Coco Key. The company has invested $250 million to turn an island in the Bahamas into its own private resort, to take passenger monetization to record levels. As we covered earlier, cruise ships continuously monetize passengers for anything and everything when they're on the boats. But when the ship docks, those same passengers are no longer physically available to be monetized once they disembark. The shore excursions are decent money, but cruise lines really want to milk every single dollar possible from its passengers. From a psychology standpoint, it makes sense that passengers are generally more frugal and more cost-aware when they're on the boat. No one wants to blow all their money on stuff on board at sea, and everyone saves up in order to have enough so that they can really go all out when they reach their destination. For Royal Caribbean, having their own private island and resort as the destination means that the company doesn't lose out on the greater spend that happens on land. Coco Key is where the adventure and monetization reaches even greater heights with water parks, zip lines, pools, balloon rides, clubs, restaurants, bungalows, and cabanas. And of course, some of these are free, but most of them are not. 
Because Royal Caribbean owns every part of the resort and the underlying land, including all the sand and trees, the company can once again sell and charge anything it wants. While all cruise companies mark up the goods and services that they sell on board, those prices must remain in a reasonable range relative to its competition. In the case of Coco Key, there's really no comparable. When a Royal Caribbean cruise arrives at Coco Key, passengers are essentially walking from one monopoly on water into an even more aggressive monopoly on land. For instance, Royal Caribbean charges between $1,500 to $4,000 just to rent a cabana for a day. The rental cost of a cabana can be just as much if not more than the cost of the cruise itself. This is why there is no public pricing available for Coco Key. Prices for island amenities are only revealed upon booking and they fluctuate daily. Coco Key serves over 10,000 guests every day who are all brought to the single destination from various Royal Caribbean ships around the world, which enables true economies of scale for the company. Royal Caribbean's passenger volume sits in between Norwegian and Carnival, as the company has grown from 4.5 million passengers in 2010 to 6.5 million by 2019. Spend on Royal Caribbean cruises is marginally higher than Carnival, as total spend per passenger grew from $1,472 in 2010 to $1,671 by 2019. Ticket cost per passenger on Royal Caribbean average only at $100 more than Carnival. Onboard spend is slightly higher on Royal Caribbean as the cruise line boasts a wider assortment of specialty restaurants like Johnny Rockets and fewer complimentary options. With marginal differences in spend and pricing, Royal Caribbean's bottom line is in the same ballpark as Carnival with an average annual operating margin of 14%. The final interesting part about cruise companies is how they keep their operating expenses low. As we touched on earlier, each single cruise ship requires a crew of 500 to 1,000 workers to keep everything running smoothly, sailing the boat, entertaining guests, cooking food, cleaning up, and running the attractions. To have a large workforce, tens of thousands of employees who must be fed, clothed, housed, and who are stuck on a boat away from home for months on an end, these workers must be well compensated. And the reality is that they are, just not by Western standards. Cruise payroll accounts for less than 25% of total operating expenses for all three companies. In the various industries that we've covered over the past three seasons, labor costs are conventionally 35% or higher. The simple answer here is offshoring. Royal Caribbean doesn't have a single US-based employee working on their ships. Instead, the vast majority of the shipboard workforce are people from the Philippines, Indonesia, and India. These international workers who make the artificial environment and manufactured magic of cruises come alive for passengers are paid on average just $14,400 a year. On Carnival, the annual wage for a shipboard employee is $25,000. Norwegian, who has always emphasized its great premium service with smaller crew to passenger ratios, pays the highest at $26,000 per worker per year. These labor costs are offset by the automatic 18 to 20% daily gratuities that each cruise company charges each passenger based on the room type as a prepaid line item during booking. When passengers use an onboard service during their trip, like ordering a drink, eating at a restaurant, or getting a massage, they're heavily encouraged to also tip then. Cruises are a fun business in not just how they monetize travelers, but also in the way that these three big companies attempt to differentiate themselves from each other. The reality is no moat lasts long in this industry. The only barrier is cost, and each company is always trying to one-up each other and achieve differentiation in the most amusing and bombastic of ways. Upon seeing the success of Coco Key, Norwegian and Carnival have started investing to transform their own islands into new, modern, flashy resorts. The funny thing is that all three of these companies have owned islands in the Bahamas since the 20th century, but two of them never bothered to develop that land until a third paved the way. It's easy to poke fun at cruises from afar, as big, lumbering, lifeless artificial environments that are populated by seniors and Americans who are so hooked on consumption that they're not satisfied riding roller coasters, watching musicals, and eating mediocre food on land that they have to do it all on a big boat at sea in the middle of nowhere. But given that cruise profits are stronger than airlines, and that the strategies can be so diverse in such a small niche market, and the conversion of passengers into effectively walking cash cows, it's clearly a business worth learning about and from. It'll be another decade before we'll be able to tell who has won, but for now, it's a three-headed race between low-end value-oriented simplicity built on free food and cheap booze, mid-end extravagance and razzle-dazzle, and high-end elegance and opulence.